I'm Sandy Peterson, and we're going to talk about the Empire of the Invisible God in God's War. Now, the Invisible God Empire is not in the core game. He is part of the Empire's expansion, and he is very unusual. Uh, <clears throat> first off, let's talk about his... Uh, the first thing you notice is his buildings are different. He doesn't have shrines, temples, and ziggurats. He has castles and towers, two kinds of buildings. Uh, he also has only three kinds of units, two minion types and one lesser god. Doesn't have a hero, doesn't have any greater gods. He's odd. I, I guess technically they would argue they have a greater god. He's just invisible and intangible and above everything. But in the gameplay, he doesn't get a unit that is invisible god. So let's talk about his ability. First ability, uh, his advantage is the wizard gate. This means that all of his castles and towers are adjacent to each other when you're taking an action. So you can move between them and do anything else you want between them. Any kind of adjacency thing that it requires, you can teleport across the map. So generally, it's in your interest to set up your castles and towers so they're far spaced apart so you can reach everywhere. Because they're really adjacent from your point of view. Now, your weakness is ecumenicism. And what this means is that all of your castles and towers count as temples for other players. So if they want to conquer one of your castles, they attack it, they can replace it with a temple. Okay, if, uh, if a moon is using the moon burn ability, they can burn your castle as if it was a temple. All those things work for you. Now, it doesn't go the other way around. When you kill one of their temples, you can't replace it with a castle because you don't have any temples in your store. So you just have to like kill the temple, then wait for a later turn, then place your, place your building. So uh, this is a major handicap, but it's made up for by some of your advantages. So let's talk about those buildings and your units and how they work together. So the Invisible God has two buildings, castles and towers, and these are connected to their minion types. We'll talk about that in a second. These buildings cost two to place. One of the handicaps of the Invisible God is that he doesn't have any buildings that cost one. So that's obviously inconvenient for him. Now, these buildings uh, are two building types, um, and you don't upgrade them. They're just like he has two different buildings that he can place. Their combat ability is that if the enemy force in their area has any minions in it, then they add a route. If it doesn't, like if they're attacking with only lesser gods and heroes, then you don't get to do the route. But if they do, then you get the route. Now, you don't have to route a minion. <coughs> the enemy player could pick that the route you do is to his lesser god or something, but they do add the route if there's minions. And if they don't have minions, you don't get it. So it's kind of this weird, almost like a temple, but not quite as good. Um, but there it is. Now, their units, they have two kinds of minions, unlike every other player, and they have one type of lesser god. Now, their minions are knights and wizards, and the knights are tied to the castles because the knight's combat is one per castle. So if you have all, all three castles in play, your knights are worth three combat each. And for a unit that only costs one, that's pretty good. Now, the wizards are tied to the towers, and their combat is one per tower. So if you have three towers, the wizards are three combat each. However, the wizards cost two power to place, so they're not as cheap as the knights. You may be wondering, why would I place the wizards? We'll get into that in a minute. Some of the gifts make you pretty interested in placing wizards. The specters are the lesser gods. Now, the specters cost two, like other lesser gods, and when you are defending with a specter, its combat is one, like everyone else's lesser god. But when you're attacking with a specter, with a specter, in other words, if you declared battle, the specter has a combat of three, which makes it kind of the best lesser god. When you're in a one power unit give, gives an attack of three, the specters are really fabulous units, and you are uh, wise to uh, use them when you can. Okay, <coughs> let us discuss the gifts of Invisible God, and this is indelibly tied to the fact that unlike every other faction in the game, they have four fragments and eight gifts. Now, one obvious thing this means is when they fill in their fragments, they can get up to four power or four victory points. This is a pretty big edge, and it's part of the reason that they only have six buildings, because that is a huge uh, uh, boost for them. Now, three of their hero quests are based around destroying enemies. One of them is eliminate an enemy mortal. If that mortal is a hero, get a VP. Now, usually you'll do this by killing a minion, but if you do manage to kill a hero, you can get a VP as well when you get your gift, so you gotta think about that. Then you have eliminate an enemy god. If it was a greater god, also get a VP. So again, you can get a lesser god and just get the gift, or kill a greater god and get a VP as well as the gift. Of course, a greater god might be hard to kill. Um, 
but there it is. Finally, you eliminate any enemy building. If that building is a temple or a ziggurat, then you get either one or two VP. So if you kill an enemy ziggurat, you get two VP. Kill an enemy temple, you get one VP. Kill a shrine or a chaos nest, you just get the gift. But you can kind of scale your expectations accordingly. Now, three of your gifts are based on your own units being killed. Kind of like a martyrdom thing. You get one of the gifts when one of your wizards is eliminated. This could be by any means, like for example, the enemy may sunspear him. That's, that's fine. You get, you got, he, he's, he counts. Another is you get a, a gift when one of your knights is eliminated. And if the enemy isn't cooperating by not coming to attack you, you can go attack them and get this. And the third is if either your building or your specter is eliminated. Now, it could be the building, but quite often it's the specter. And we'll get into that later on for other reasons. Because you, can, you have ways of killing your own specters, which is kind of cool. Your final two gifts... <clears throat> well, you don't have to be the last ones you get, but the final one I'm talking about. One of them is, if another player targets you with a gift, you get this. <clears throat> now, in a game with Chaos, this often you often get this gift during the uh, console phase when Chaos uses, I fought, we won. But it could be any gift. It could be Storm hitting you with Courage, or Sun Spear, or what, anything. You know, Black Market goes to you, that's, hey, target me with a gift. The gift could be good for you or bad for you, doesn't matter, gives you that gift. Okay. And, they're, and uh, often the last gift they get, the last hero quest they accomplish, is called the Final Ritual. Now, three of your uh, gifts are called the Book Gifts. It's the Red Book, the Blue Book, and the Brown Book. And when you... and these gifts are used... are ostensibly used once and they're flipped face down. The final ritual hero quest lets you flip all of your face down book gifts face up so you can use them a second time. Now if you have book gifts in play that aren't face down, then they don't flip face up because they're already face up. So you don't get the full advantage out of the final ritual. So kind of you want to wait till you've got all the book gifts in play and you've used them all once and then you use this, they flip face up again, then you can use them all again for a second time. So they're kind of like, not a one-use gift, but a, like a two-use gift. But sometimes, because of the games going a certain direction, you don't want to wait for that to happen, you need that gift, and so it just depends on what you're doing. But in an ideal world, you'd uh, take all three, use them, flip them face up again with Final Ritual, and then use them again. But since the world isn't perfect, sometimes you have to rely on other uh, aspects. So now, we will discuss... It is nice that, by the way, before I go on to more discussions. It is nice that the final ritual is something you can do at any time. Even if you have no book gifts or none of them in play, you can just go ahead and trigger it. And this one gift you can get whenever you want is an action that costs nothing. So, on to the Invisible God's gifts. I did mention there's a way they can kill their own specters. This is called Magic Explosion. You select a specter in the battle just before you roll dice and kill it. That killed Spectre's combat plus two is added to your battle total. Hey, plus you got a power because a Spectre was killed. And you got that gift for killing a Spectre if you needed that gift. So if you're attacking with the Spectre, its combat goes from three to five. If you're defending with it, it goes from one to three. Not quite as exciting, but still not bad. And uh, quite often you're in a situation where you know the Spectre is going to be killed anyway. So screw it. Go ahead and explode it, right? There you go. Okay, next gift. Sturdy Peasantry. This gift effectively is like an indestructible off-map castle. So you get an extra castle. So even though you only have three castles you can place, this is a permanent castle like in another dimension, I guess, which always counts. It counts for victory points. It counts for the purpose of getting power. If it's the only castle you have, it still counts for two power. And it also counts for upping the knight's combat because they get one combat per castle. So in effect, you could have up to four combat for the knights if you had all three in play, plus this virtual castle from Sturdy Peasantry. Okay, now here's one of the reasons that you like having wizards. The tapping ability in the council phase. If you have wizards in play and you have tapping gift, then for each area where you have wizards, you get one power. Since you have four wizards, you could place all four in different areas and get four power. In addition, there's a side bonus which is that every enemy player then rolls dice, and if they roll equal to or less than the number of power you got from tapping, they lose a victory point. So, for example, the best of all possible worlds, you have four wizards in four areas, you get four power, all the enemies roll a d6, if they roll four or less, they lose a victory point. 
the, and the ones that lose it whine and gruff at you, and the ones that make it are like, yay, I didn't lose a victory point, but I still hate that Invisible God got uh, four power. So then they may want to come kill your wizards, but that's how the game works. Okay, you then have the King's Blessing gift, which also happens in the Council phase, and it lets you place a castle or tower for free in any legal area. That means an area that doesn't already have a building that's set to cast nest. So, <clears throat> if for example you kill a building near the end of your turn and uh, you aren't able to pay to place to replace it with a new building, you can wait till the next council phase, put one there for free. Um, I have seen games where the map gets filled in with buildings and you can't use the King's Blessing, so it's incumbent on you to go around and be like cleaning up some of the buildings so there's empty spaces for you to place it in. Um, uh, the last gift before I get to the uh, book gifts is called Divine Right. This gives you a rune every council phase. Plus, if at least three play if three or more players have more victory points than you, you get another rune. It's kind of a catch-up thing. Now you don't really want to rely on that because you'd rather have more victory points, but if you are falling behind, it helps you catch up to get that extra rune every turn. Um, now, the Books of Power. Now, these are one-use gifts. You'll probably notice they're not quite as good as other players' one-use gifts. Well, this is because they're actually two-use gifts, thanks to your action, where you can flip your book gifts, the final ritual, where you can flip them back up again, so you use them twice. So keep that in mind. So first, there is the Red Book of Power, which is an action that costs zero. Use it once. You place a free specter at each of your towers. Then you take one rune and flip that gift face down. So if you use it the second time, you can get another rune, and do, but it lets you get free specters, which is always, always a, a fabulous thing. So uh, if you have three towers, you get three specters, but even if it's only two towers, that's still two specters. Specters are great. They're one of your best units. You always want to have specters. So what's not to like? Then there is the Blue Book of Sorcery, which is an action that costs zero. This is very interactive, because what happens is every player, including you, rolls a die. Then you look at everyone's die, and you choose if they're going to keep it or not. Okay? If they don't keep it, then they're done. They don't worry about it. But if they did keep the die, because you said so, then the next time they have to roll dice, whether for combat or for sun spear or any other purpose you roll dice for, that die is one of the dice they roll. It replaces one of them. So typically what you do is if you, if you roll something good, like you roll a six, which is a kill in combat, you keep that, so you got that kill. If other players roll something sucky, then like... You make them keep that. So it lets you kind of affect, usually about half the players keep the dice, about half of them don't, depends on what you're looking at, right? But you can do it twice, so it's pretty useful and it kind of discombobulates them all. It doesn't last very long because it has to be the next dice they roll, but uh, for a little bit it's good. Also, it lets you delay play because it's an action that costs zero. Then you get the Brown Book of Commerce, the final book gift, and this is it takes place during the Commerce phase, the Council phase. What happens is you're in one power for each tower. You notice a lot of these gifts target towers. Um, you have the Red Book of Power, which puts a specter at each of your towers. Um, uh, and then you have the, well, two of them do. And then the, then the Brown Book of Commerce gives you one power for, for each, uh, each tower. Uh, this is up to three tower power, obviously, if you have all three, but it's commerce, not just profiting. So what happens is after you take your power for each of your towers, then you divide up an equal amount of power among the enemy players. So say, for example, you have all three towers, so you get three power. You then divide up three power among the enemies, like two for darkness and one for earth or whatever you want. You know, you can give all three to the same person or divide or one and one and one. Uh, is that what you please? But the thing is, it benefits them, it lets you do a little bit of help for other players, diplomacy, that kind of thing. And then afterwards, you get a rune, put a face down, just like all the book gifts, including, by the way, um, the Blue Book of Sorcery, which I forgot to mention, it gives you a rune as well. So if you use all the book gifts twice, that's six runes from that. Plus, you get a rune every turn from your Divine Right gift, <coughs> which means you can actually be racking up quite a few gifts as uh, Invisible God, and use this in an effective way to uh, tap your enemies of their victory points to go forth and destroy them. You're handicapped a little bit by your um, inability to straight up conquer their buildings, but you're greatly benefited by the fact that your minions roll multiple dice in combat, you've got that free extra building, you have more units than they do because you have four of each kind of minion plus four of the uh, specters, which is a total of 12 units. That's 25% more, it's 33% more than they get. So you are a really interesting and flexible faction to play. Um, even though you only have three kinds of units, and that's the Invisible God.